Five million people a year come here and visit. They can't all be wrong, can they, Steve? No, Steve, they can't. Sorry, that was me asking myself a rhetorical question, but I didn't mean to answer. We're at the British Museum. And this is just one of these places in London you could spend weeks in and still not see everything here. So we're going to give you a quick tour around, show you the 10 things that if you're coming to the British Museum, you've got to come and see in person. So if you're coming down here, you can make the most of your trip. OK, are you ready? This is the amazing British Museum established back in 1753. The amazing thing is the British Museum is completely free to get in. So it's another one of those great places you've got to come and visit. Now here we're in the Great Court, which is the glass roof Lord Foster built piece, which was opened in 2000. So yeah, it was renovated and redone then. So when you walk in, this is the first place you're greeted with. And believe you me, just do look at the glass. Make sure you look up because this roof is absolutely incredible. At this museum, there are over 13 million artifacts that you can come and see. And the whole point of this video is not to discuss the artifacts as such, but just to show you them so you get a feel for them. So if you fancy coming down here, you can. Right, let's start off with our first thing that you've got to see, and it's here in the Great Court. So these are both two cedar wood totem poles, which come from Graham Island, which is in British Columbia in Canada. And both of these are 12 meters in height. And just look at the intricate carvings on these. Both of these are believed to date back to 1850. And to get the best view possible like this, take the curved steps which go up by the side of it because it really gives you a fantastic view of the poles, but also the intricate carvings on it as well. So we go from these turton poles and let's go 300 years earlier to the beginning of watches. Yes, we're here and the earliest watch they've got showcased here is back from 1560. And the bigger the number that's demonstrated by the side, the older the watch, so don't worry. We will be going back and have a look, but look at some of these sort of pocket watches and the detail that is on there, which also not only shows the time, but also the different stages of the moon and the stars as well at the same time, which is incredible. The detailing on the watch lid itself is quite incredible and these would have been kept in the pockets. Now this is the oldest one that they have here and this is the one from 1560, which is quite something to say the least. And all of these are built out of gilt brass. And the earliest ones were actually built by German watchmakers. When you look at these, you just think the detailing is absolutely incredible. And you just think about it. These are nearly 500 years old and were some of the original timepieces. And we're going to show you some original clocks as well in just a second, because they have a whole section here dedicated to time. Now, how about this for a clock? This is called the rolling ball clock. And the time was kept by control by a rolling steel ball, which takes 30 seconds to zigzag down the table, operate a lever, which causes the table to tilt, as you can see, and then send ball back in the other way. And over a year, the ball travels around 2,500 miles, which is incredible. And that's from about 1805. If you wanted to make a statement, you get a clock like this for your mantelpiece. Absolutely incredible, and that's from 1650. But how about some of these? Now here on the left-hand side, you've got some mantelpiece clocks here, but on the right, you've got something completely different. You've got someone who's milking the cow and a walker nearby. So the way this clock operates is the staff held by the walker tells the time. And this is driven by the cow's eyes, which move backward and forth when a switch is set. And the milkmaid milks the cow and liquid, believe it or not, held in a reservoir inside, comes out of the udders as she moves her arms up and down. Incredible clock making from Poland. At 60 centimetres wide and from the year 300, this is the Milton Hall dish. Now, all of this silverware was found in Milton Hall in Suffolk, in a massive hall that was just happened to be discovered with all of this in here, which is quite incredible, considering it dates back so far. Now, as we're going between different bits, we're going to show you some other things as well, like this, which is a must see, but it's not on our list. This is a gold cape and was worn by women, probably for ceremonial religious purposes and actually dates back from 1900 BC. Yes, that old. 
And when you're a museum and you've got so many bits to display, what do you do? You put them in the stairwell. Now this is a cast of a palace doorway from Iran from 470 to 450 BC. So what you've got is the king sitting on his throne holding a scepter and also a lotus flower. Now behind him stands an attendant and above them has got a richly decorated canopy. The throne supported by a huge platform with lion's paws and three rows of figures with each of them wearing different costumes from the Persian Empire. Our next recommendation of must-see things here in the British Museum is this, the collection of jade, which is just absolutely incredible and dates back many thousands of years. So in China, jade has been highly valued for thousands of years and of course is revered as a rare and precious material associated with power and wealth. Now the objects on display here illustrate the history of the precious stone, priced for its beauty and magical properties. Here we're looking at a number of sort of different animal shaped pendants from about 2000 BC. Here we start off with bird pendants which were carved with angular heads or were crested and then we move on to something which is quite rare which is reptile and dragon pendants and these from about 1200 BC. Then as we go through we've got fish pendants here which were extremely rare especially done in three dimensional and then two human figures from about 1000 BC. What I love is these two objects which I'm about to show you which is this disc here and also this long object here. We still don't know what the use was. Now these are made out of jade and were found in the tombs of the elite that were buried many many years ago but they're still unknown what they were used for. Here we're looking at early forms of earrings with the slits down the centre so you could actually put them over your ears. And the longer piece of jade you can see here was actually found in tubes near people's hair. Once again, it's unknown what it was used for. And how about this as a vase, as a solid piece of jade? Absolutely incredible. And the bangle. There really is something magical about this material. Right, our next place, it's the Room of Enlightenment. Yes, you heard me right. So this room is the name given to a period of discovery and learning that flourished among Europeans and Americans from about 1680 to 1820 changing the way they viewed the world. This was also a time when Britain became a global power and grew very wealthy, with a significant part of that wealth coming from Britain's colonial empire and its active involvement in the transatlantic slave trade. Housed in the oldest room in the museum, originally designed to house King George III's library, this diverse permanent exhibition shows how British people understood the world at this time through their collections. The displays themselves convey a sense of how objects were organised and displayed during the 18th century. Sir Hans Sloane's collection with several additional libraries and collections became the foundation of the British Museum. While the Enlightenment thinking and collections provided the foundations for much of our present understanding of the history of human cultural achievement, they also tended to tell the story from a predominantly European perspective. This period and its legacies, as you probably now know, are being increasingly reassessed from a range of critical perspectives. It is one of those rooms that you step into and you do feel like you're stepping back through time. Meet Hoa Ho Kananaya. God, that was impressive, wasn't it? Yeah, I'm not doing it again. This monumental carving made out of basalt represents an Anne's sister figure from the Rapa Nu Easter Island, which is famous for its monolithic statues. Now, if you can get close enough because everyone's taking selfies in front of it, handsome fellow that he is, once upon a time, in his eyes, he would have had inlaid in there red stone and coral, and the figure itself would have been originally painted red and white with various designs on it. Now, this was first displayed in the open air before being moved to a stone house at the ritual center of Orango. If you thought we weren't going to cover some more controversial things here at the British Museum, we are. If they're here, why don't you come and see them, at least while they're here anyway. Anyway, that's a completely different debate. Right, let's look next at the Rosetta Stone. Now this bears text in Egyptian hieroglyphics, Demotic and also Greek, and its discovery enabled the modern decipherment of Egypt's ancient pictographic script. Now the text is actually a decree from the Council of Priests affirming the royal cult of King Ptolemy V. 
Here we go, we want to give you a close-up view of some of the things that are here, and you can see the different types of writing as well. Now, this tablet dates back to 196 BC, and it's probably one of the most popular things here at the British Museum, so you do have to wait your turn to get near the front. Now, as we walk through the museum, we come across more statues, and as you can see here, a lot of these are sort of Italian design. This is Crouching Venus. Now, something similar was done in Greece, and it was called Crouching Aphrodite, and was a popular subject for the Greek sculptures, as she was for the Romans, who called her Venus. And this sculpture is a Roman copy of the much earlier Greek work. Now here we have a pair of statues, and either of these would have stood either side of the entrance to the palace of Korsabad back in 721 to 705 BC. These are both winged bulls with human heads, and were there to ensure the guardians didn't suffer misfortune. Along with the absolute must-sees here at the British Museum are the Elgin marbles. The Parthenon at the Acropolis at Athens was built between 447 and 432 BC as a temple dedicated to Athena, patron goddess of the city. The temple's great size and lavish use of white marble was intended to show off the city's power and wealth at the height of his empire. The temple, richly decorated with sculptures representing scenes from mythology and cult, the frieze carved in low relief, ran along all four sides of the building inside the colonnade. So everything we're looking at in this room is a collection from ancient Greek sculptures and also structures from the Acropolis of Athens, removed from the Ottoman Greece to Britain by angels of Thomas Bruce, who was the seventh Earl of Elgin and now held here at the British Museum. So whilst called the Elgin marbles after the Earl, the real term is the Parthian marbles or the Parthian scriptures. And these refer to the sculptures, the frieze, metatopes, and also pediments from the Parthian held in various collections, but mainly here at the British Museum. From 1801 to 1812, Elgin's agents removed about half the surviving Parthian sculptures, as well as sculptures from other places around, and sending them here to Britain in an effort to establish a private museum. Elgin has stated that he removed the marbles with permission of the Ottoman officials, who exercised authority in Athens at the time. However, the veracity of this claim has been disputed quite a few times. The marble's presence here at the British Museum is the subject of a long-standing international controversy, and in Britain the acquisition of the collection was supported by some, while others, such as Lord Byron, likened Elgin's actions to vandalism or looting. There was an inquiry held in Parliament in 1816 that concluded that Elgin had acquired the marbles legally, and Elgin sold them to the British government in that year, after which they passed into the trusteeship of the British Museum. Discussions between the Greek and the UK governments are still ongoing, and even UNESCO has decided that they would get involved if they could help in the mediation process. My only point would be, as they're here, get here and see them whilst you can, in case they do go. Our next place to look at is here. It's the Egyptian mummies in the Egyptian Antiquities section, which has over 100,000 pieces to be seen, which is quite incredible, and is the most comprehensive collection outside of the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Wow. Now, I visited this section several times, and the reason for that is quite often you can't actually get close to the exhibits because it is just so busy in here. So yes, it attracts people from all over the world to come and see these things, because once again, as a free exhibition, seeing these sorts of things you'd only normally get to see in Cairo, wow, you've got to get here to come and have a look. So the Egyptian department itself is absolutely massive and spans on different floors, but up here on the second floor there's only a selection of the 140 mummies and coffins that they actually hold here on display. Just look at the decorative features on these mummies, which are absolutely incredible, and also the gold gilding as well on the faces. Just by coming here and seeing these on display, but not just the outer casings, but also the inner casings, and also in some of the displays, what was actually buried with the mummies when they actually found them in the pyramids, or alternatively in the tombs in which they were discovered, is really, really impressive. And just look at the artwork inside here, inside the coffin piece where the mummy has actually been lifted out.
you really can see why this is a popular area. And here you've got some female sarcophaguses as well, or sarcophagi. And one of these was one of the high priestesses in Egypt as well. Really hope you're loving our visit to the British Museum to give you the 10 things you've got to come and see in a short amount of time because there is just so much here to see. And if you are, you know what to do. Give us a thumbs up and also subscribe if you haven't already. Now it's time to go to the Americas and for Aztec. And here we've got different types of mask, all with that similar Aztec style. Plus also here we have the double headed serpent mosaic. And this would have been worn for ceremonial purposes and would have been worn on the chest. This mask and the other masks that you'll see were created by the Aztecs to wear in religious ceremonies and also in death. And the masks were placed over the mummified head to protect the deceased from the dangers in the afterlife. So in this tucked away section of the museum, which looks at Mesoamerica, not only does it look at the Aztecs, it looks at the Olmecs and also the Mayans. And all of this is from central Mexico and dates back between 1200 and 400 BC. It's incredible to think that these things have been brought to the UK, sit here in the British Museum for people to come and see, but date so far back and also are free for people to see as well, which is absolutely incredible. So if you get a chance, do make sure you get down here to the British Museum. So what did you think of the British Museum? Have you been there? Do let us know in the comments down below. And also watching this, which is the department or which is the area that you would head for first? Let us know down in the comments, It'd be really good to know. And also the good news is when you get there, you can pick up a free map as well. So it'll show you all the different bits. And that's what I did. And then circled all the different areas that I wanted to make sure I hit. Right, really hope you've enjoyed seeing this video on the British Museum. Now we're gonna take you to a video on the Natural History Museum, where there are so many other great things to see here for free in London.